Well, welcome to the Beyond the Lines podcast. In a world filled with so much division, we just want to do something about that. We all have these lines that we draw in our lives that we just feel like that's our limit. We can't listen past that line. We can't love past the line. We can't understand someone who's on the other side of the line, whatever that line is. But our goal with this podcast is to treat all people with the dignity that they deserve, even if we disagree with them. My name is Jonathan, and I'm your designated listener here today on the podcast. And we have some incredible people here today with us in Mikhail and Carissa Sundust. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm yep. glad you're here. Thank Thanks you for, for having us. us. Awesome. I've had just this incredible opportunity to get to know you guys a little bit over the past year, and I've just learned so much from you. So I'm glad you're here, and that's why I wanted you on the podcast. Um, you both come from indigenous tribes in the Phoenix, well, Arizona area, and uh, you have so much wisdom to share. So I'm glad you're here, and I'm excited to learn from you and Wow, you know, how are you feeling tonight? How do you feel about it? This is your first podcast. I guess a little nervous because yep. I've never been on a podcast before, but I'm looking forward to it. And I always enjoy our conversations. So um, just looking forward to that. Awesome. Well, you did mention before the po- we started recording that you've you've recorded a podcast before with your friend. What? <laughs> not online. No, not not anywhere. Nowhere, nowhere it, ex- to- it exists. It's in it's in the trash bin on my computer. <laughs> So you have tons of experience with podcasts is what I'm hearing. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. I've been in radio for years. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Um, well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I know this is out of your comfort zone, but I, I know you have so much wisdom to share. So I think it, anything we can learn from you tonight is is well worth it. So thank you for being here. One of the reasons I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today is because um, we get to learn more about the indigenous perspective in America. But before we begin, if I understand one of the correctly, one of the biggest misconceptions uh, that those who don't have any knowledge about indigenous tribes in in the Western area, right, is that they're all the same. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions. So I want to start there. That's just not true. I want to learn more about what tribes you guys are from and what that means to you and, and what that means for your experience and how that can be different. Yeah, sure. Do you want to start? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a she Carissa Sunda Sinish, yeah, be betotni nishlin, kin the chini bashes chin, kia ani dasha che, torich ini dasha nele, uh, tapi kin dan na sha, akot ego san nishlin. So, I am Navajo, my name is Carissa Sundust, and that's our traditional um, introduction. So, we always introduce ourselves with our four clans, starting with our mother's clan, because we're a matrilineal system. And then we'll also share our father's mother's clan our maternal grandfather's clan and our paternal grandfather's clan and then also our place of origin on the reservation Mm. so um i i choose to say um which is where my paternal grandmother is from mostly because that's where i grew up a lot of the time um i i didn't have the chance to know my maternal grandmother and she's actually from not on which is navajo mountain Mm. um so sometimes I'll use those interchangeably, but um, those are the areas that I'm from on the Navajo Nation. Um, so clans are really important. Um, kinship is really important. And so we identify ourselves in this way so that we can show um, who we are. And if there's uh, other Navajos in the audience, it's a way to c- create a connection so that people know mm. whether or not I'm related to them in a certain way. So that's really important whenever yeah. we're introducing ourselves, especially in a public setting like this. So although there's not people in front of us, there will be people listening to this. Yeah. So it's very proper for me to introduce myself that way. Awesome. So the Navajo Nation, um, we're, we call ourselves Dine. We're located in northeastern Arizona. Um, we are the largest tribe both in population and in land base. Mm. So our reservation covers... 27,000 square miles, which is about the size of West Virginia. Wow. Um, And then I'm located in, there's there's different agencies. So there's the Eastern Agency, Central Agency, and the Western Agency. And I'm from the Western Agency. Okay, yeah. (laughs) So that's just a little bit of like um, an overview of like my tribe and where I'm from. But I'll let Mikhail introduce himself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Mikhail Sundust. I am Akimet Autum and Piposh. And those two tribes, and that's on my father's side, uh, those two tribes are um, more commonly known as Pima and Maricopa. So we have Pima County, Maricopa County in, in Arizona. But um, like Carissa said, the Navajo 
uh, word for Navajo, what they call themselves is Diné. And so we, the Pima, what uh, we call ourselves is Autumn. And there's there's a few different Autumn tribes. And then um, Maricopa, they call themselves Piposh. And so that's, uh, that's where I get uh, my uh, heritage from. On my dad's side, he was both Akhmet Autumn and Piposh uh, from the Gila River Indian community. So uh, for, you know, listeners from Arizona or anybody who has Google Maps, <laughs> <laughs> there you, go. um, you can look up just south of Phoenix is the Gila River Indian community. And it stretches all the way from the west side in Levine to the east side south of like Queen Creek and the Santa, San, Santan, Valley. Santan Valley. Thank you. Sorry. Santan uh, Mountains. Hmm. Um, so that's Gila River. I'm from the west end south of Levine. Uh, that's where my father and uh, his family is from. And on my mom's side, I am of Central European descent, uh, mostly Czech, like the Czech Republic yeah, and probably like a little bit of like Scandinavian blood and German in there as well. Yeah. So that's, that's my heritage um, from both my parents. Is there anything else you wanted me to include? No, in there? I, I think that's very fascinating and um, really important for us to know and understand as we are kind of approaching this. So that you can't speak for all tribes in the U S like that's impossible, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, there are, 574 federally recognized tribes mm, and it's important wow. to say federally recognized yeah 574 is a big number but there was even more than that right. you know uh there is more than that there are a lot of state recognized tribes and when we talk about state re state recognized and federal federally recognized what's important to keep in mind is we're talking about a political entity like a government like a city or a county or a state right these are tribes they're they're political entities um and they have their heritage is attached to that. Um, one example is here in Gila River, or in Arizona, we have the Gila River Indian community, Salt River, Akchin, and Thonautam Nation. And those four reservations or political governments, um, they all have Autumn people living there. That, that's where uh -huh. they're from. So you've got the Thonautam, um, Salt River, they often call them Onakamara Autumn because they're from Salt River. Um, mm. So, so, yeah, 574. We're definitely can't speak for all. I can't even speak for my tribe alone. You know, right. I can only speak for myself yeah. and my experience um, as an indigenous person. And same goes for Carissa. I wanted to also mention that uh, there are 22 tribes in Arizona. So 574 across the country, 22 in Arizona. Mm. And um, some of them are quite small. They don't all have land bases, meaning like reservations where okay. they can, you know, put up. But they... Um, but they all have some form of government and uh, a tie to their uh, indigenous heritage. Okay, that's what I was, that was my kind of my next question or follow up is like they have some kind of government or um, some way to govern their 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 people. Yes, it's like our own nation. Correct. Yeah, um, I would love to hear more about um, for you guys specifically. You spoke really well that you only could really speak to your own experience, even within your tribe, right? Which makes total sense. None of us. I can't speak for all. <laughs> you know, I don't even know what I am, honestly, but <laughs> I've never taken like a 21 in me or anything. So I have like <laughs> no really reference to my heritage. And so I can't, but I can't speak of everybody who looks like me or my, even for my, just my own nuclear family, like my mom and dad, like I can't speak for them. So you only could speak for yourself and your own experience, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just like saying, I can't speak for all Christians, you yeah. know, and you can't speak for all Christians. I mean, we all have our own experiences. Definitely. So I'd love to hear more about how you were raised personally and what your childhood was like. Like, did you go to public schools or were you uh, at schools just for indigenous tribe uh, p uh, kids or were you raised on the tribe's reservation? I think that's, you know, there's a different situation for everybody. So I want to hear more about your own situation and experience if you are willing to share it. Yeah, um, I'll start first. So I grew up on... I grew up in Grand Falls, so it's very, it's like right next to the border um, of the reservation, um, 30 minutes away from Flagstaff. Um, so my parents were actually in ministry when I was younger. So my dad okay. was a pastor and my mom, um, you know, was a pastor's wife and she did like Sunday school and everything. So um, when we were growing up, he would move a lot and change different to different churches and um, so Grand Falls was the one when I was younger that we moved to and that he was pastoring. So I lived there for a, 
a good amount of my childhood. So I was on the reservation there. And however, um, because it's only about 30 minutes away from Flagstaff, we would commute into town for school. So I was still attending public schools in Flagstaff. Um, but there's an interesting dynamic when it comes to border towns. Um, they're, they're, they're still like, um, it's, there's still prejudice that's there. Um, even though, um, yeah, so there's a good population of Navajo, Hopi, um, Hualapai who live in Flagstaff, but it's really difficult sometimes to live there because there's a heavy prejudice, um, wow. that comes with being in a border town. Um, and then in, di- in addition to just, um, living in Grand Falls, I would go back to my grandmother's house, um, often. So I had a significant amount of my childhood at her house as well. So, um, yeah, I would say that a lot of my childhood was, was on the reservation, but I did have my education in Flagstaff. And then eventually towards the end of elementary, my parents managed to move us into Flagstaff. So then I started living in the border town. Um, and sort of experiencing more of like what that diamond, what that, what that dynamic was like. Um, because, uh, if you know, flag stuff, it's very (laughs) affluent. I mean, there's a lot of people who live there who are very, um, well off and the, there's a definite, um, divide, like a social class divide there. Um, and unless you live there, you don't really see it. Yeah. But once you're in like the classroom, you definitely can tell like the students that you become friends with versus the people who don't want to be friends with you. Um, so I had a very, I mean, I, I was friends with a lot of different students, but I would say the, the majority of my friends were Navajo. Um, and a lot of them were, they either lived in Flagstaff or they bust in from, um, Loop, which is a nearby town. Um, so the, a lot of my friends came from that area. Loop's on the reservation. Yeah, Loop is on the reservation. It's just like 20 minutes away from Grand Falls. So it's okay. very close to where I was um, growing up there on the reservation. Um, but yeah, I was heavily influenced by the church as well. We, like I said, my parents were um, in ministry. So I wasn't raised traditionally. Um, so that a lot of that knowledge is sort of lost on me. And it's something that I've... I'm trying to relearn and reclaim now that I'm older and I have that ability to like ask people um, more in-depth questions about that. Um, And definitely the Christianity or the, the context of Christianity that I grew up in was very conservative, which taught me that my culture was bad, that Mm. it was evil um, and that it was something that I shouldn't embrace. And so it was really hard to like, have that sort of pulling on me because I personally saw the beauty in my culture. I saw the significance in my culture. And I think a lot of that has to do with my dad because even though he was a pastor, he was really good at giving us cultural teachings um, growing up. And one significant one is the idea of rising before the sun and running towards the east. Um, In the, in the Diné way, that was a way that you would get up and start your day and um, pray to the holy people and just just start everything in a good way. Um, but the way that my dad would teach us would say, you know, this is a significant part of your culture. You need to wake up and go running. Um, and he would say it in a way that he's like, no, we need to acknowledge that God has given us a new day wow. and that we need to like, to be thankful for that every day. And so he always like managed to like strike a balance between um, maintaining our cultural ways, but also reinforcing a lot of um, biblical teachings that he wanted us to know. So I was really grateful to have that balance, but it was really difficult because when I got into native spaces, it was like, I didn't know enough to be in that space. in ter- terms of like traditions and everything. Okay. So I really struggled sometimes to like fit in with with that side. But then I'd go to like the Christian side <laughs> and it would be the opposite where it's like, um, no, that's too conservative. You know, I don't want to like give up everything of who I am as a native person. Um, but it yeah. was definitely something that was like uh, pressing uh, throughout my childhood and even into like high school and a little bit into college as well. So that's a little bit about my background. Yeah. 
sounds like you're living in the tension of like two different worlds and neither of them felt quite right. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's funny, we talk, <laughs> there's a phrase that um, Native people talk about and it's it's more about the tension of living in the Western world and the their cultural world and it's called walking in two worlds. Wow. So there's this dynamic that they talk about. But um, yeah, for me, it was definitely not necessarily it was the Western world and the Navajo world, but it was also the Christian context and the cultural context there as well. So, how about you? Yeah. Uh, so I, um, I did not grow up on the reservation, and I didn't grow up in the church either. Well, I was raised Catholic, okay. so yeah. I kind of grew up in the church, a church. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, the the Catholic Church. I don't want to get too off off topic, but the Catholic Church has a pretty um, heavy influence in Altham communities. Mm. And that has a lot to do with the history of how uh, the Western world arrived to this area, the like Sonoran desert region. Um, you know, in, oh, it was around 1700, uh, actually years before that, um, probably a hundred years before that, when Father Kino arrived. And so the Spaniards brought Catholicism and mm. all of that to this region. So just all that to say, you know, Catholicism has a pretty heavy influence here in, um, in Southern Arizona. And, um, I grew up, let's see my, um, my mom and dad met in Gila river on the reservation. She, she's originally from Wisconsin. She was in the area, uh, teaching and my dad was working in the school as well. They met and my dad, um, made the deliberate decision, I think, to um, move off the reservation when he started this family because he had a pretty difficult life and mm. he was, um, I mean, just from what I can understand, uh, we, I lost my father um, about two years ago, but from what I understand, mm. uh, you know, his decision making, his thinking was to get off the reservation to give his family some distance between um, all of the challenges that come with living on the reservation. Okay. And um, so, so my brother, I have one brother younger than me, and we, uh, we grew up in Casa Grande, Arizona, just, you know, south of the Gila River Indian community off reservation, also a border town, but <laughs> smaller in size, um, which also means I didn't really grow up with a lot of my traditions either. And so what, I mean, one of the things I tell people often is, you know, it's, it's, um, been a journey for me to learn my culture and all of that later in life, Okay. you know, um, during, uh, later in high school, college and after college, um, learning bits and pieces of the autumn language, learning a little bit about the, the history, the songs, the uh, traditional stories, the traditional practices, um, all of that, you know, has come later in life. And so I've really enjoyed getting to learn that now, but a small part of me is sad that I wasn't able to learn that growing up because we yeah. lived, we lived off reservation when I was a kid. So, wow. It sounds like both for both of you, you've had to, you've both mentioned like having to learn more about your heritage and culture later in life. Um, and, and you talked a little bit about why that is, but can you talk a little bit more like why, I mean, why is that, is that something that's common right now with your generation? Uh, what are you finding as you're learning that and, and the difficulties with that? Yeah, I would say that it's, it's pretty common, um, unless someone has been fortunate to like be raised by like elders and cultural teachers. Um, many of the people in my generation, we don't know the language. Um, we also don't know a lot of the teachings. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, intentional decisions by our parents to get us educated outside of our communities. Mm. Um, and then also this push for education. So, like, um, education is huge in Indian country. So, like, when, when they say, you know, graduate high school and go to college, um, that doesn't mean that once they go to college that they're able to come back home as easily. Mm. So once they're away at college, it's like they lose connection to the language, they lose connection to the, the ceremonies and things like that. 
So then while they're away at college, they, they start, something good is happening and they're getting educated, but they're also losing a lot of that cultural knowledge. Hmm. And then there's also been um, policies in place throughout since like the 60s, uh, maybe a little earlier, um, where there were programs put in place for the people to leave their reservation to get work. Um, so they were being moved to these major cities like San Francisco to Phoenix and everything to get opportunities to work off the reservation. But again, that meant leaving their land base and wow. then again, losing cultural knowledge. But you kind of see um, a lot of a different dynamic happening in these urban areas where the the people who are there, they start to try to reclaim. And so they build these um, urban communities of natives where they're trying really hard to like maintain cultural knowledge. So even here in Phoenix, you have the Phoenix Indian Center, mm -hmm. which is a place that um, a lot of native people gravitate towards too, because they offer courses and programs and workshops for people to learn things like rug weaving or yeah. um, language classes or singing classes and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I, you see a resurgence of people being interested in that because for so long we've been told um, in one way or another that our culture is bad mm. and that we need to assimilate to American culture. Um, and one of those things, I know we might talk about it later, but um, a significant part of that is boarding schools. Yeah. So I don't know if Mikhail has anything more to add to that. Um, yeah, I was going to jump into the boarding school discussion because, yeah. um, do you, and do you mind? Definitely. Let's do so, it. So, because I mean, really, um, what Carissa is talking about, you know, we've been starved of our culture for a long time and it really goes back to the boarding school policies that the federal government implemented, um, both here in the U S and Canada had, had a similar programs. Um, and the idea behind these boarding schools was, um, uh, to what was the phrase uh, kill the Indian save the man and so the idea mm. was anything that is Indian or Native American about this person is not worth saving it's irredeemable and we're just going to make them like us and make them um, you know in in the image of an American white man type uh, thing and bring these Western teachings to them and we're going to make them like us that's assimilation mm -hmm. And so um, for, for generations, Native people have been starved of their culture because it's, it's been stripped from them, you know, through uh, children going to boarding school. They're not raised with their culture. And then when they come back, it, how, how are they to continue their culture or carry that on yeah. or teach the next generation? It's very hard to do that when you have so many people lost to the boarding school system. And that's kind of what happened um, I mean, I can say that's kind of what happened in my lineage, you know, I mean, my dad, even though he grew up on the reservation and he was, you know, very embedded in his community, he didn't have a lot of his culture and he, he grew up with the language and then he, he lost it. He forgot it because of, you know, just going to the Western schools um, and being integrated into the greater society. So things like that, they, um, they do a lot of damage to, you know, a people's culture. And that's, that's what has happened to us. Wow. And, uh, you know, that's a tragedy for sure. And I remember talking about boarding schools with you, um, a while, not too long ago. And you mentioned that you really didn't get to hear much about it from your parents, I believe. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I think Carissa has, you know, a better, um, perspective on that. But yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, both my parents, they went to boarding school when they were younger, um, and so my parents are 61 and 58 or 59, something, you know, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm 32, going to be 33 and only in the past two years, honestly, have they started to open up and tell wow. me more about just small, um, instances wow. that happen at the boarding school. And, um, I know that a lot of um, the the effects of it have been, I've already felt them like in the way that they raised me and the way that they, um, even the way that they related to each other. Um, there's a, like a huge breakdown in like emotional intelligence um, and just being able to like, you know, manage your emotions and 
deal with different things like that, that the boarding school took away um, because they weren't, they weren't out to teach that they were, it was like a military style school or school, if you can call it that many of us, you know, when we talk about boarding schools, we put it in quotes cause we're like, these were more like um, prison camps. Like really? they wow. were really just there to like, um, again, there was a military style um, institution there. They were, beating kids they were um there was a lot of like terrible things that were happening in these institutions um and yet we label them as schools um and so a lot of that stuff that my parents have only just recently started to talk about has made me extend a lot more grace to them and just kind of understanding their story and where they're coming from um but it comes out in interesting ways and you know, my dad talked about um, a teaching assistants that they had, and these teaching assistants would um, be there in the classroom, but they'd also be there in the dorms later. Wow. And one time he was talking to me about it, and he said, I don't know why they, they call them teaching assistants. He said, all they ever did was beat me. And that really, like, broke my heart because it was, like, it was such an honest statement, um, but it was something he had never expressed ever before. Wow. Um, so yeah, just, just until recently, my parents are opening up a little bit more about what it was like being in there. Um, uh, and I think because there's been a lot more discussion around boarding schools because of things that have happened over the summer, um, they're just a little bit more willing to talk about it because it's sort of coming to the surface, um, yeah. at least for the greater American society for native people. We've always known that this is the reality and that this is what's been going on, Mm. but only this past summer have they made um, discoveries of mass graves that were next to residential schools in Canada and then boarding schools here in America. And so it's been really eye opening for a lot of people. Um, And then sort of, I don't know what the word is, but for native people, it's like, finally like finally people are seeing our reality and our only hope is that people see the reality and that they acknowledge like that this is that this is something that is truly uh, impactful like to our 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 communities to our well-being and to the reason why you know there's there's a lot of issues that are going on in our communities as well um you know things like substance abuse or uh domestic abuse things like that they don't they 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 come there they exist in such great amounts on the reservation but nobody asks why they mostly just say oh look at like how terrible it is out there but they never stop and question like why is it like that and they never go back to like these these policies and um, the, the boarding schools and how they have basically corrupted an entire generation, um, actually two generations, I believe. So if you meet a native person, they, they say this a lot, like on social media and everything. If you meet a native person, a, basically any native person you meet is either a survivor of boarding schools, um, the child of a survivor or a grandchild of, of a survivor because we've all been affected by it in yeah. one way or another. Um, I think. Yeah. And, and I mean, really the, the silver lining of, you know, discovering these mass graves, which is just awful. You think about these are children, you know, babies that were taken oftentimes from their homes and never returned. Um, yeah. I was going to ask how young, like they often were taken from. I mean, I don't know what as young as, yeah, three Wow. Uh, they were they were just you know very very young um, and this was you know the government in instituting these policy policies, so uh, but the silver lining of finding these mass graves is a lot of these communities are finding healing wow. through um, uh, and closure through the discovery of these graves where they can say okay we we knew that you know our baby went missing or something like that and wow. now we have a uh, some sense of closure. And um, the the first discovery uh, that I was aware of is at Kamloops um, in Canada. Mm-hmm. And after that, a lot of uh, Native communities were like, hey, we need to look at this school and this school and this school. And they started to find all these mass graves at other boarding schools as well. Um, 
Kamloops is in, is in Canada. So that's a residential school in the U.S. They call them boarding schools, but same idea. And as indigenous communities started to um, uncover these graves, uh, you know, they, um, they got a sense of closure and they started, they could perform ceremonies for, for the mm-hmm. loved ones that they lost. And you asked about, you know, like um, rediscovering our culture. That's a huge part of it. Again, I can't speak for everybody, I, I know, but I, you notice a lot of um, like language revitalization programs that have started up because That's Native cool. people are saying, you know, oh, I know a few words from when I was a kid, but I really want to learn my language, you yeah. know. Uh, same thing with storytelling. And in a lot of communities, they have songs that you sing, you know. And so there's a lot of programs on within tribal communities where they're um, self-generating these uh, revitalization programs um, and teaching as, you know, the young ones, even like, you know, two and three and four years old in, uh, what do they call that? Head Start. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, teaching them the language early so that they can learn it easier and carry it on. Yeah. So that's, I mean, it's it's terrible to think about, you know, all of the damage that the boarding school system did and the loss of culture in native communities. But it's really encouraging for me now to see all of the re- revitalization efforts mm-hmm. and the learning that's going on. So I'm, I'm encouraged by it and I'm, you know, hopeful for the next generation. Yeah. I, I want to just add to that um, something more personal, I guess, to both me and Mikhail. Definitely. Um, because we found out about the the mass graves i believe at the end of may yeah um so the very beginning of the summer that's when we found out um and it it was really hard so um trying to like keep my composure through this it was really hard to like hear about that and then just uh, just a few weeks later um michael and i found out that we're pregnant Mm -hmm. and that we're gonna have a baby and i think that added to like the grief of yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a celebration. Um, we're gonna have a baby, and and it's it's exciting. But it started to make me think really deeply about like what that must have felt like to to lose your child, you know, to like to like have somebody come in from the government or from the church and steal your baby and take them away and then to not see them for you know one or two years and then and then maybe not see them again and not know why Mm -hmm. and so it's it was really difficult over the summer when people would ask like hey what are your thoughts on this and i you know i was like i'm not in a space to like yeah talk about this because i was still really like processing and grieving Mm -hmm. um and trying to figure out how to to reconcile all these feelings that i had uh, because of that but now you know we're about halfway through and we're gonna we keep talking about just what we're so excited to like teach them because mm-hmm. of the things we weren't able to do when we were younger and yeah. we think we just we're so hopeful about like you know building a cradle board for our baby or um getting you know doing their first laugh ceremony just things like that you know it just makes me so excited because then i'm like this is what this was this was all about you know like um that's like when i see hope where i'm like i'm i'm now in a position where i'm not gonna allow my child to ever be told that they can't embrace their their culture that they can't learn their language or you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm in a position where I can empower them and make them feel confident in who they are as an indigenous person, because I never had that when I was younger. So I think that that's so exciting and something to look forward to now. Um, and yeah, we're constantly just excited about the things that we get to teach our child. Hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Like that, that, that means a lot to me that you're, you feel comfortable to, to share that here. And I, I think it matters a lot to the people listening as well. And if it doesn't, I'm sorry <laughs> for them, <laughs> you know, like, because that's so powerful and I'm really happy that you get that opportunity to, um, and that, uh, maybe it's getting a little bit better. I know that we are just scratching the surface on, um, what has happened in the U S and, and Western society in general for indigenous people and, and nations. I know we, we've just barely touched it. Um, 
but I want I want to ask another question, and and uh, this is something I think we've kind of talked about too. Is like it can be, and you just mentioned it too. It can be really exhausting, constantly to be asked questions, and tiring, and especially if maybe it doesn't seem like it's coming from a sincere place. And uh, you mentioned that that has happened a lot over the last year with all these things that are going on. Um, what are some good ways? I, I know you're not asking people not to ask you questions at all. Like, but what are some good ways people can educate themselves and go deeper now that we've scratched the surface and they're interested? Like, how do they go deeper? Um, it, are there any resources that you recommend? Any books that you recommend uh, to learn more about the indigenous perspective? Um, I love to learn more. I'll, I'll say this. I'm, I'm, we're happy to talk about this kind of stuff uh, to, to share people, but you're right what we mostly encourage is folks to educate themselves to learn more on their own. Um, so if you can, you know, take the time to read a book, listen to a podcast, things like that. Um, when I, uh, for, for example, the Gila River Indian community has resources on their website. So, if, I mean, if you Google Gila River, we can probably spell it on the screen, right? Yeah. G-I-L-A. I'll put it Gila, in the show notes. Gila River. There yeah. you go. They have resources on their website that talk about their history, you know, and tells about how, you know, we've been here since time immemorial. Our ancestors um, built the canal system that even we use still today, uh, wow. that yeah. Salt River Project SRP uses. Um, there's all that history is available online, really, with a Google search. Uh, so those kind of things are easy if you know the tribe that's in your area. Google them, find their website if they have it. And you can you can look up some history there. If you don't know what tribes are in your area, there's another website that we often use or recommend to people. It's native-land.ca. Okay, cool. Uh, that website will it brings up a map, and you can go to where you are in the map, and it'll tell you what tribes are in your area. Wow. Or have historically been there. Um, another uh, resource. So I recently read a book uh, called Braiding Sweetgrass. Mm. which just knocked my socks off. I really love it. It's uh, by an indigenous author. She's Potawatomi. Her name is Robin, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. She's a botanist, and she blends in, in this book, it's, uh, she blends science and traditional teachings into this beautiful storytelling, um, and it's really great to learn a little bit about um, different tribes cultures but also the history and then the science of how they engage with the natural world yeah um, God's creation so I, I really love that book and I recommend it to anybody who's interested um, do you have some yeah so for anyone who's local to Phoenix um, there's a herd museum and they actually have a really great exhibit on the boarding schools so if you want to wow. learn more about that that's that's definitely um, a great place to go but then even some of the surrounding tribes have their own mu cultural museums um, and they're really awesome they're really great they have different events that are open to the public as well like even storytelling events mm -hmm. so that cool. you can learn more about their culture um, obviously once COVID has calmed down um, they're going to open that up more yeah. but um, the, yeah I would recommend going to the Hoogum Museum in... The Hoogum Heritage Center is just south of Wild Horse Pass. Yes. Okay. And then they have one on Salt River as well. And then I think there's the um, Pueblo Grand Museum, oh, right? Yeah. In mm -hmm. uh, central Phoenix as well. So there's a lot of resources locally. Yeah. And then um, on social media, I just wanted to highlight one um, account. They're called Illuminative. And they're working really hard to change um, or correct the narrative yeah. of Native people, especially in mainstream media. And they're doing a really good job. They're raising a lot of important issues um, when it comes to like news reports, uh, film and television, and different things like that. And so that's a really good account to follow because they're all constantly educating people um, about you know, native people and putting them in a positive light rather yeah. than um, stereotypical or negative light. So, yeah, um, those those are really good resources, and there's plenty more. <laughs> yeah, um, there's plenty more books and everything, but that, I'll keep it at that for now. You dip your toe into all those. We'll we'll include as many links to websites as we can in the show notes. So go look there. If they're not there, you, you can look on your own. So <laughs> you can do it. Um, 
Thank you so much for being here. I so appreciate getting to hear your perspective and be able to record it here on the podcast and share it with our audience. Um, just praying that that we continue to broaden our perspective for those of us who don't have this this experience in our lives at all. Um, this is I hope is an eye opening uh, podcast for you and it has been helpful for you. Um, that I think that's it for today. I mean, I would love to talk for hours, and I have with you guys before. Yeah. <laughs> I've talked for hours. <laughs> Um, but at last people don't listen for hours. So we're going to stop it here for today, but maybe we'll have you on again someday. Um, and, uh, yeah, for those of you who are still listening, please consider giving us a review on iTunes. That might help you help get the word out about this and, and help more people hear what we're doing here at beyond the lines and just listening to people's stories. Also tell somebody, tell your friend, tell your friend about this episode. If you think that they would really learn from it as well, share it out. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Beyond the Lines podcast. We record here at Central Christian Church in the Phoenix, Arizona Valley, and our church is pursuing the mantra of love beyond, which calls us to empathize with people who are different and build bridges of peace. If you're interested at all in learning more about our church, check us out at centralaz.com. We have online services as well as a bunch of locations in the Phoenix metro area if you're local. We'll see you at next time's episode of Beyond the Lines. Until then, start loving beyond your lines. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you.